Chase, I think I'm going to hear more about you. I really do. I think you've got a way about you, but you're interviewing, mm-hmm. your um, pleasantness, you're smart. So I think I'm going to hear big things about you. All right. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Chase Thomas Podcast where I'm still the aforementioned Chase Thomas coming to you live from Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, taping this right before or right after uh, the Tennessee Volunteers smoke uh, the Florida Gulf Coast Eagles. Uh, big, big win for Rick Barnes in the program Woo. here on a Wednesday night down there in Decula, Georgia. My good friend and fellow University of North Georgia alumni, Matt Green. Matt, good evening, sir. How are you? Good evening, sir. I didn't realize until uh, until last night um, just how how little like college basketball kind of registers uh, with me now. Like we got hmm. Michigan State, Kentucky, Duke, Kansas. Like Duke, Kansas some version was amazing of those last games. night. My notes, I didn't watch I, a I second fun, of yeah. it. I watched uh, I watched a lot of the Michigan State, Kansas. That was also a bonkers Kentucky game. game. Probably just because I was waiting on the playoff rankings. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm just watching like. Uh, uh, Shibwe, is that mm-hmm. how you pronounce his Oscar name? Oscar Shibwe, yeah. Like, it's literally the only player I knew for, like, all four teams. And I'm mm-hmm. just like, it's it's insane. Um, and I don't even know how to pronounce his name. I wasn't 100% confident on, on that pronunciation just now. But, yeah, got it's it. just college basketball. It's just like, that's a, those are two marquee matchups last night. And I'm just kind of like, ah, who, who, who's playing? I don't know. Well, we're still in the, the, the heart of college football season. So I think your brain has to, like, adjust a little bit. And college basketball also doesn't do a good job of scheduling a lot of big time matchups out of the gate. Like last week was the first week and they just had nothing on the slate. I don't know why they do that and shoot themselves in the foot with not doing these big time, um, these big time matchups like do Baylor versus uh, Tennessee, do um, U- uh, UCLA versus Duke. Like they don't do a lot of that very often. I mean, Tennessee's about to go to the Bahamas for the battle for Atlanta. So they do this like many tournaments, like the big 12 SEC classic and stuff like that but by and large I think part of the reason that college basketball is not at the forefront or doesn't jump out immediately for a lot of folks is because they just don't put the big games on the middle of the week when people when you don't have college football to compete with I I don't know why they don't start off the season that way speaking of I don't I'm I'm not mistaken I don't think Georgia made the big 12 SEC challenge (laughs) I think there's like well there's Oh, is it? It's just ten teams now, right? So I guess yeah. there's four SEC teams that were left mm. out. But yeah, it was. Uh, I don't. I guess you just leave out the bottom four. I don't know. Cut well, it's fat. a bleak state of affairs because I've seen a lot of Georgia fans just talk about like the bit by bit. It's like you're already seeing the the dividends, Mike White coming in there, and you're seeing the bit by bit that uh, Tom Crean did. And it's like, all right, let's let's calm down. Let let's let's calm down on the the Georgia rise. The problem with, for Georgia and basketball is just that like the SEC is now a basketball conference too. And there's so many good teams. I think there's so right now Alabama, Auburn, um, Tennessee, Kentucky, Arkansas, and who's the other team ranked right now? There's someone else who I'm missing. Not Mississippi, not Mississippi State, uh, not LSU or LSU. I guess LSU is the other one. Um, that you're just it's just a dogfight, man. Like there's so many good teams, and this conference is like so well coached now that. I don't know. It's really, really hard to to win. And I mean, Cal's next class. He's got four of the top ten players in the twenty twenty four class now, all committed. With DJ Wagner being the headliner, it's just it's tough. It's tough to to get out of the gutter in a lot of these conferences, the big time conferences. Without a doubt, we'll uh, we'll give Mike White some time. Florida's like, hey, so we're anyway, trying to uh, Georgia basketball. Florida's like trying to make Final Fours. George is like, hey, can you come give us a competent past basketball program? We're we're cool with that. Make yeah. the tournament a couple times. That's that's all we really want. Can we? Can you be good enough to keep Xavier Wheeler happy so he doesn't transfer mm, to Kentucky? Like that's a tough like blow. That. Seeing that, that's actually one of the few players I could name last night. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a JJ CM. Frazier was he there should, at UGA for like seventeen years. Yeah, it's a. Uh, Were you a big Jarvis Hayes guy? Oh, huge Jarvis Hayes! That that was that was the heyday of Georgia basketball. Jarvis Hayes and Ezra Williams. Oh yeah, man, that was a, that was a squad they had. Mike Mercer not really working out. I would Remember say that? Uh, that was the last time they w- legitimately won the SEC. Obviously, there was like the fluke winning the SEC back in oh seven oh eight. Still counts. Sundiata Gaines era. Zach mm-hmm. Swanson. 
uh, all the, all that that crowd. But yeah, there you go. Uh, Matt Green college football playoff rankings come out. No changes in the top five. Um, after that, though, a little bit of intri- intrigue with LSU moving to six, USC at seven. Um, not really expecting any any movement there. What uh, what did you make of the latest CFP rankings? Yeah, I think we knew there wasn't going to be too much uh, going on this week, uh, just because you know nothing really crazy happened last week. Um, but one thing, and you know, at this point, the committee would really just be like stirring up a controversy if they did it. But that's kind of what they're doing, right? Don't they just kind of want this to be made for TV drama or whatever? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's is that the Michigan just being kind of the automatic number two or uh, number three? I should say it's like what are we really basing Michigan being better than, than TCU on? Hmm. Like they have the Penn state win like that. And they blew out Penn state. That's by far their best win. And I'd say it's probably better than any other, uh, win that TCU has, but TCU does have win over wins over three teams that are currently ranked like Kansas state, Oklahoma state and oh Texas isn't ranked anymore, but like three wins. Like, I feel like those three wins are, more impressive than the, I would say, probably the rest of uh, Michigan's schedule. And, and the Kansas win, too, early when Kansas was actually a good team and, and blowing out Oklahoma the way they did. I feel like I I would, on a neutral field, I think uh, I could pull up. I think Brett McMurphy kind of had a tweet about what all these teams in the top four would be ranked uh, favored on neutral field. I'll see if I can find that. But I would probably favor Michigan on a neutral field, but, at, at like, at this point, I feel like TCU has a has a, a claim to be number three. I would agree. Um, I would agree with that. Um, I also think it, it's just funny. I wish they could do because I know they have the connections. I wonder if Vegas is a part of this where the committee, they go to them and just be like, on a neutral site, how would the odds be right now? Like, I wonder if they do that because partly you need to do that or need to have some sort of idea of what the, the odds would be if you played these games on neutral sites because – Ultimately, this four-man group, like, they can do whatever they want. There's no rhyme or reason, and that's why it's so frustrating week to week um, to figure out what they want to do or what they want to say, and it's partly because the committees change, right? Different people on the committee this year than from a year ago, some holdovers, some not. Um, They're not really open about what all they're looking for. We're just kind of guessing what they're looking for, and then unnamed sources talking about what they're looking for. So... I don't know. I, I thought this was um, Michigan is clearly like I've said for the last few weeks that the top four teams. And I think if the committee had to be honest about it, like privately, they would say the top four uh, is Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State and Tennessee. And I think those four would all be favored over TCU on a neutral side. And I talked about on the Sunday show that Peter Burns talked to somebody and he tweeted it is like if USC and Tennessee were uh playing on a neutral site this weekend what would the line be and they had tennessee seven and a half so it wasn't even like a toss-up it was just like tennessee would be favored um in that kind of matchup and i think we all acknowledge that like that's the weird thing i was listening to uh Stu mandel and bruce feldman on the audible podcast which i like a lot and bruce is one of my favorite like college football analysts he's just so uh calm collected and reasonable and i just you always learn something when he's talking about it and he's very plugged in obviously with the pac-12 and one of the things I thought was odd is they have collectively decided that if 12 and one USC runs the gauntlet, that that would just be a better resume than Tennessee at 11 and one. And I don't buy that because they also talked about like, well, you don't really have a, that would imply that they like, you would get a ranked victory over Notre Dame now because they're net ranked. So that, that would be a bigger win. That would be beating a ranked UCLA then beating a ranked, um, uh, either Oregon or Utah in the Pac-12 title. So that's three straight rank wins. Their schedule, strength of schedule looks a lot better if that's what they do. Because right now there's no path to them getting in as a one-loss team over Tennessee based on their strength of schedule. The problem with all of that, and this is something that I think is discounted in terms of Tennessee, and I was thinking about this the other day, is Tennessee, when they're like, oh, they didn't participate in the, the conference championship game, so uh, they're they're going to be hurt by that. Here's the thing. Tennessee, because of how stupid this is like Tennessee might get screwed based on the outdated divisional 
alignment in college football, right? That if this was a couple years in the future where it's just we're taking the two best teams at the end of the season and they play in the SEC title game, we don't have to worry about a two-loss LSU team that ran the gauntlet, got curb stomped by Tennessee who only had one loss, and then being like, oh, well, they won the conference, but Tennessee didn't play in the conference title game, even though Tennessee beat down LSU in the regular season, but because they're in the same division as the best team in the conference and lost their one game to that better team, they are now having to sit out while LSU can make up ground and can kind of control their own destiny in a way and make the college football playoff by winning that game. But it's like Tennessee would be there. Like without divisions, it's a rematch in the SEC title game between Georgia and Tennessee. And I I don't know. Have you thought about that at all? Because I think yeah, when people this... talk about the LSU stuff and the, the Tennessee missing the conference title game, I'm like, this should be a big reason why we talk about, hey – the division system is stupid and it actually kind of hurts some of these really good like teams that should be in the conference title game, but they sit and they miss it because we have the big 10 West getting to go and we're like, they're not one of the, like, this is silly. What are we doing? So Tennessee is clearly better than LSU. They've already shown it on the field, but they're going to get hurt by LSU playing in this game because their side of the conference didn't have Georgia in it. It's, it's just very stupid to me. Yeah, I mean that's this is kind of how it goes, right? Obviously, it's it's going to you have to have divisions in this fourteen team uh, conference that we currently have. Mm-hmm. Like when the with the new model of the schedule, I think it it will be more even, and I think there will be more uh, you know validity to just taking the top two records. But right now, that's basically what you have to do. And this is a this is kind of a perfect storm scenario, also with Tennessee specifically playing and beating the two best teams from the SEC West mm. this year. It's like, this is the first year, I mean, what? You gotta probably go back to like 2000, like pre Saban at least for the SEC West, the winner of the SEC West to not be like a shoe in for yeah. whatever the national championship or the playoff. So the SEC East is really where this has happened more often where you've seen like a 2000, 15, 2016 Florida get in as like a 15th, 20th ranked team or or like Georgia back in 2011 uh, versus LSU. Like typically this is just a, a straight up quarterfinal playoff game. Like it's it's either one of these teams is going to get to the playoff and, and sometimes both of them can get in, but like we saw last year. But yeah, I mean, it's hard to get too mad about the system, especially because I, I don't think, it's not that Tennessee... It's like it kind of works both ways. It's not that they're going to be penalized for not playing on conference champion chip weekend as much as other teams are just going to be rewarded for playing on conference championship weekend. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like... Well, they're going to be out of sight, out of mind, and that's going to exactly, hurt Exactly. That 13th data point that they kind of talk about, like you're going to see USC, and it's hard to it's hard for people to get that image out of their their mind. When Oklahoma is a one-loss Big 12 champion, mm-hmm. when now you potentially USC being the a one-loss Big Pac-12 champion, I think it's a really interesting conversation to have. Personally, I just think with college football being what it is, and the fact that we don't get the these so many of these matchups between the best teams every year, I think you just kind of have to default to taking the best team from each region if possible you know what i mean if if there's a year where the second best sec team is just so clearly better than anyone coming from any other conf from like the fourth or fifth best team like when it's obvious like it it was last year i mean it wasn't necessarily obvious back in like 2017 when they took alabama over ohio state but I want to say Ohio State had one more loss that year. I'm not 100 percent sure. I don't, I don't think they were 2017. With that was the year they owned Haskins. They, are you talking about the year they missed the Big, to- Big Ten title game? No, they, it was Urban Meyer's last year. I want to say they, I want to say they won the Rose Bowl that year. Um, mm-hmm. But they were they, they they finished fifth definitely. Whatever year Jalen Hurts and Alabama where they were the four when Georgia won the SEC. Ohio State was definitely fifth, and they won the Big Ten. But I, I, they might have had two losses. They had year. to have had two losses, which also speaks to the LSU question. That hasn't happened yet. So people who are penciling in LSU, if they win, beat Georgia, they're in. The, the committee has not put in a two-loss team yet. That has not happened to this point. The committee also hasn't 
hasn't left out the SEC champion before, right? Either, you know, but I, I different personally different circumstances though. They've never been in this kind of. Well, I guess the closest is that Auburn year, right? Where Auburn beat Georgia. They were and number, yeah, they were number two going yeah. into the SEC championship, so they were a hundred percent going to make it if they. Mm-hmm. If they but were LSU's the six, so it's just different being number two versus number six going to the SEC title game. And with the opinion of Georgia right now, too, that they're just so far and away the number one team, I think you just you have to kind of put yourself in that mental headspace of like, how are we going to feel about LSU if we see them beat this team that we all think is just by far, far and away the number one team? So I think that's what kind of changes things. It's still hard just because Tennessee has that head-to-head win and a better record. Like, it's just hard to see them jumping. But in terms of the USC conversation... I, I felt like Oregon Oregon felt much more like solid of going twelve and one. It just they seem like a much better team. Like USC, these are gonna be the three toughest games, maybe in order. But I would say UCLA is probably better than Notre Dame. But to finish the season, like I'm I'm personally twelve and one USC versus eleven and one Pac twelve champion USC versus eleven and one Tennessee. I'm taking USC mm. to be that final fourth spot. I just think it's it's a conference champion and it's it's not a team that's just head and shoulders better like i do think tennessee is better probably but after those three wins those three ranked wins to, in the, to finish the season their their resumes are going to be comparable like as good as alabama and L, like lsu if they lose like they probably should i mean might, they're, they're going to be favored to against georgia like lsu might finish the season ranked you know roughly top 10 12 alabama's eight to ten like those are really good teams but you you usc will have a legitimate resume if they if they knock off uh usc notre dame and whoever it is utah or oregon like i feel like it is a legitimate resume and then also the the pac-12 champion aspect to it i just personally don't see usc running the table like i just Mm. i don't see it happening and so i think it, it feels like a lot of a lot of talk especially with the lsu georgia thing like LSU beating Georgia seems more unlikely than than USC running winning these last three games. So I don't. It's an interesting conversation to have, but it's just hard to see all these teams taking care of business and keeping Tennessee out. I think Tennessee is just is just sitting in a good spot. Like I, you haven't really heard one person mention the loser of Ohio State Michigan getting in the playoff. Like. Mm-hmm. Maybe we're because the resumes just aren't really there. So mm. to ha- the fact that one of these two teams ahead of Tennessee is going to get knocked off, and then you know LSU is going to have to play number one. USC's got the toughest three game stretch. I mean, we're counting three games. They could they could lose to UCLA and still not get in the in the Pac twelve champion uh, title game. So I think there's still like five teams that are uh, alive for making the Pac twelve title game. So. I personally would take USC, but like I said, I don't I don't necessarily see him doing it. That's the thing is like I'm not really fretting it uh, up here on Rocky Top because th- what I tell folks is just that like I'll f- I just I don't see the path to TCU and USC both taking care of business for the next month. I think one of them taking care of business is very possible, but like you, I think TCU is significantly more likely to take care of business than USC. And if USC does that, then I'll take my chances with georgia or the lsu win over georgia or something like that like that kind of odds are just already stacked um extremely high i thought i think i've seen already seen an early spread where like dogs would be favored by 20 20 21 against lsu on a neutral side i really? think that's what i saw 20 yeah i just i don't think it's a good matchup for them i think lsu is just i i don't know we'll, we'll, we'll cross that i mean yeah I've, I've always said that i mean those these quarterbacks that are kind of run first dual mm-hmm. threats like they're limited passers. Like Jaden Daniels has been really good, but he's, I mean, what he threw for like 75 yards last week yeah. versus Arkansas. Like uh, Georgia's a little bit better than Arkansas defensively. But I have, I feel like people are throwing out a lot of uh, like, I don't know, chaos scenarios that I just feel like are, are too much chaos. Mm. But some quote unquote chaos that I feel like is, is like realistic, likely to happen. Mm. What happens if, uh, if TCU. Excuse me. Is TCU one, loses one of these uh, final two games, wins the conference, and we have a one-loss Pac-12 champion, ver- and then Michigan. They say Michigan loses to Ohio State, and we have one-loss Big tw- uh, Michigan, one-loss Big Twelve champion TCU, and 
one loss USC for that in the, in the, in the pack 12, like what, who, what, ha- I think Tennessee, I, I, Tennessee, excuse me, Tennessee. Hold on, repeat this again. This spot. was, you went out a lot. Hold on. Repeat the one losses. Hold on. So Georgia, Ohio state, Tennessee are one, two, three here. Okay. Michigan lost to Ohio state TCU uh-huh. say loses. They put Baylor this week. Uh-huh. Say they lose to Baylor, but win the big 12. So they're 12 and one USC runs the table here. They're 12 and one. I think and, USC gets that four spot. And that's spot. it. So it's Michigan, USC, TCU, all with one loss. I think mm-hmm. USC gets that spot. See, I, I don't know. I, th- I think T- TCU still has a really good resume with, with just a one loss. And Michigan, mm. their one loss is just to Ohio State. Like, I think there's... I just think the committee wants to dump TCU. There's a reason they started behind Bam in that opening, uh, that opening thing. It's just... They're, they they kind of feel like they have to put them in the top four to just not uh, be disrespectful, but I, I just I don't think so. And I I think everyone's concerned about Georgia TCU in the quarterfinal. I think everyone <laughs> on that committee is like, are we gonna do this? Or are they are are these college football teams really gonna make us do this? Are they really gonna make us do this? Because we've seen Lincoln Riley versus Kirby. That's fun. That is something that is appetizing to viewers and people at the tv networks and everything else they would like to see lincoln riley versus kirby again because that was probably the best college football playoff game of all time right george oklahoma i would have to say so i mean maybe clemson alabama national championship i don't think it was better george oklahoma is the best one i think like the final play but yeah that was uh the rose bowl game was insane yeah so i think you would and you're like caleb williams who knows like that would be fun like i think they would be much more inclined to take their chances with lincoln and caleb uh, in that group jordan addison so and company. I, th- I think that's interesting you had usc getting going in ahead of michigan but yeah. not us not not going ahead of tennessee wait what do you mean so like one loss, tennessee is one of those four it'd be georgia ohio state tennessee and uh usc in that scenario but I'm saying, so you do think USC, the the one loss conference champion, they do go ahead of the non conference champion Michigan. But yes, you don't have Michigan has no ahead. wins. Like that's the thing. It's like Michigan. There's no contest. They they're out of conference and everything else is just, it's just not good enough. Doesn't last, stack up. Doesn't last hold scenario: yeah. one loss TCU versus versus uh, one loss Michigan. Uh, Michigan, I think. Hmm. I don't think so. Michigan's been ahead of them this whole I time. I could see. I, I, I don't think it's fair. I could. I think one loss Ohio State goes ahead of TCU. I think one loss Michigan doesn't. I think they both do. But I don't know. I think Big 12. I think you're questioning the, the committee's The Big 12 is a dumpster TCU. fire this year, man. TCU the Pac-12 is tough four. at the top. You could at least sell me on the top of the Pac-12 because there's so many good teams at the top. Um, how many got, How many top team top 20 teams do they have right now? The Pac-12, they yeah. got they got seven, ten, twelve, sixteen, and seventeen. Yeah, five. I mean, that's and that's twenty-two. Good. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's that's not the case in the Big Twelve. The Big Twelve is a dumpster fire this year. So that kind of hurts TCU. Is that the Big Twelve is just an absolute mess? I feel like it's a mess. I don't think it's a dumpster fire though. I think there's a lot of good we teams. We might be getting Will Ho- Will Howard versus. Um, Max hey, Duggan. You better put game. some respect on Will Howard's name. Sir. I mean, that's fine, but like, you're not looking around other conferences, and you're you're in a situation. You're looking at Cam Rising versus Bo Nix or Jaden Daniels versus. Um, it could should have been just well, as close to Bryce Young versus Stetson. Like, it's just it's not the same. We all know. It's Even Drake May versus view, DJU. It's interesting how we view conference like strength, though, right? Yeah. It's like. If they have like multiple good teams at the top, then we think it's a good conference. Mm-hmm. But maybe it's a deep conference, and some of the teams are beating each other. It's it's hard to know because Oklahoma State, I feel like they're kind of that team that kind of they carry some national respect. And when they're you know when they're chilling around the top ten, top fifteen, you're like yeah they're a good team. But them they the last two three weeks, I feel like have like <laughs> have collectively hurt the reputation of the Big Twelve. I have a take. Why are we just kicking Clemson out for all these other teams? Like, I don't understand why Clemson actually is a one loss if they run the gauntlet and beat UNC. I'm not entirely sure how you get to the conclusion that USC is more deserving than Clemson. Are we sure they're better than Clemson? No, that's fair. I feel like I feel like the same with North Carolina. I'm not sure what, what Clemson has done to be nine and North Carolina's 13. Yeah. They both lost to Notre Dame. 
Like, mm-hmm. I'm not, who's Clemson? I mean, Clemson might have a couple better wins, maybe. NC well, State. Well, that's a question is... for you. Where do you think UNC would be if they were undefeated? They don't lose to Notre Dame. Where do you think they would be right now? I mean, they should be ahead of LSU at the very least. But do you think they like, would? I think so. I mean, are I, they ahead of TCU? No, I don't know if they're ahead of Tennessee. It's it's hard to say because I mean they just were. I don't know where they did they were they re, were even ranked preseason. Probably not. I don't think so. So I don't know. It just they're nine and one, so they couldn't be that different because I mean nine and one is almost undefeated. So but that's what I'm saying. Like I don't understand why. Like look, I don't think Clemson's one of the four best, but I think now the narrative just pushing, pushing, pushing USC into the Pac-12 title game and everyone being nervous about um usc running the table i'm like why are they getting more of the benefit of the doubt than clemson and i guess it's just because of the strength of pac-12 versus acc this year but i'm like i think clemson's still better i would probably stand a neutral side i would take clemson over usc i think I, the defense is still there for clemson the offense is just unbelievably shaky and not something you can count on week to week but the defense is absolutely with Breesy and company that you can count on the defense is there well, and like, why is the why is the strength of the Pac-12 helping USC when hmm. they've played one ranked team and lost? Like yeah. they played Utah. Like Oregon State, I guess is currently ranked, and they they won a, a close game that was pretty yeah. ugly. Like they haven't played the the strength of the conference. So if if they have wins over Oregon and UCLA, like then I can I can boost UCLA's resume or USC's resume, which I think they are going to get if they go 12 and one. So that that's the the caveat with USC is that they're sitting at seven because they haven't actually beaten any of those teams yet. But if they do, I think their resume does stack up. Like, I think it's a playoff resume at that point. But I the likelihood of it happening, that's that's another story. Yeah, I'm not worried. I think we'll, this will all play out uh, just fine. And uh, we'll see what ultimately happens here. Um, Matt Green, how does our pick look heading into week 12, sir? All right, going into week 12, uh, I have I now have a one-game lead against the spread. I am 62-58-4 on the season to your 61-59-4. Mm. But you, sir, are still holding a five-game lead overall. You are 84-40 and 40 on the season. Uh, I am 79 and 45, and Zeus uh, with a, a solid showing, hoping he can stay in the in the green here, uh, or in the black, whatever you want to say. Um, seven and five on the season, so we'll see if he can keep that, get that third straight victory. He's got he's got a couple of uh, two straight uh, weeks, two game winning streaks this year. He's hoping for his first thir- three game winning streak. I like it. Um... All right, Matt Green, where are we going first? All right, let's start it off. As we were just talking about this Pac-12 showdown, USC at UCLA. Bruins, two-and-a-half-point home dog in this one. How do you see it going? Um, This is tough, man. Uh, I also love uh, you being a uniform guy. This is like how most rivalry should be, where both teams wear home colors. Uh, the, this looks phenomenal. Great uniform game where both will wear. You know, George and Florida tried this out. Did they? They did. Uh, Twenty. I want to say 2015, 20, hmm. 2014, 2015, 2016. Maybe did it for like three years. George went hmm. 0 three. We said forget that. We're not doing Is that really that why they stopped doing it? I don't know if that's why, but uh, they the last year they did it was Kirby's first year, and um, they just they stopped doing it. Hmm. Um. Well, USC and UCLA. Okay, so obviously USC is now in a position where they've just been hiding out in the periphery, right? Where they're just Lincoln Riley year one, no expectations, doing the Brian Kelly thing, or just revamping the program, cleaning up in the portal. Jordan Addison's not been healthy lately. Caleb Williams been fine. But you go up and down, you're like, they're just doing what they should do. They're not beating anybody's doors off. They're just fine. Surviving against good teams like Oregon State, losing to teams that are better like Utah. I just, this is tough because UCLA had this great run to start the year and then uh, they get upset by uh, Washington or they beat Washington in an upset on that Friday night uh, in UCLA. And you're like, oh, could UCLA really win the gauntlet? And then they run into Oregon on the rib. So it just, it's like when you, 
rogue games are just tough. Uh, it doesn't matter what Power 5 conference you go to. Rogue games are just tough. I was looking at just the matchups for this one. USC is 8th in rush defense in the Pac-12. You can run all over Alex Grinch's team. Like, that's been the biggest issue is just that, like, Lincoln, the the offense is fine. It's just more, I'm not sure if Alex Grinch is the guy. Um, he obviously took him uh, from Oklahoma, but... I don't know. I think this there's all kinds of holes all across this USC defense. Their front seven, secondary, everywhere. Um, but what I like, they're number one in touchdown percentage in the red zone. Um, I like that USC still has a huge turnover margin and lead over the rest of Pac-12 at plus 17. What I like is that this is still feels like a talent advantage where... The Oregon game kind of showed that UCLA just doesn't have the same players that Oregon does. And Chip Kelly's done a really good job scheming them up and doing this, that, and the other. But, man, when you get matched up with the the top two in terms of talent in the conference, that being Oregon and USC year over year, you're like, okay, there's clearly different kind of players in the field right now. And I wonder if that's what we're going to see here uh, in this UCLA versus uh, USC matchup. I do think it's interesting, though, that UCLA is the only team – uh, in the country that has exceeded 2,400 rushing yards and 2,600 passing yards in season. So Zach Charbonnet, DTR, they love to run the football. They are going to be able to run the football all over USC. That rush defense is atrocious. They're going to be able to keep the ball away. And that's important because that turnover margin for USC, picks and other stuff, I don't think UCLA is going to put themselves in position to lose that battle. I think they're going to be able to play a game against uh usc where they're like we're gonna play keep away we're gonna just do what we we're gonna run it down your throats we're going to see if your defense can get one stop and if they can't then we're gonna win this game i also think it's interesting that ucla leads this series when both teams are ranked in the ap poll Mm. all that being said i think ucla wins this i think we at home in the rose bowl biggest game of the season for ucla huge game for chip kelly and company i think there's there's just too many questions on this usc defense and i think the usc season ends at 10 and 2 but i think they beat notre dame next week and i think they lose to ucla on the road here so give me the bruins to win outright sir all right put it on the board um so coming into this one usc at home this year uh winning by 26 points a game Mm. Uh, but on the road they are three and one winning by only 11 points a game Mm -hmm. they've played some close games every time they've gone on the road this year uh including losing to utah i don't think this will be any different i think it's it's the the rose bowl like is this a home field advantage it's sold out did you see that but is it usc fans or is ucla fans like i i legitimately like i don't really know what sort of like just seeing what they've been in recent years like i don't know how like <clears throat> rowdy of a road atmosphere this is really going to be but also like looking at ucla they've allowed 30 plus points in five of their last six games four and two in those games i feel like they're a more balanced offense but like you said with the turnovers i feel like usc is just kind of for the most part made the plays they needed to make this year i i felt like i was going to pick ucla to 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 when I, when I first started looking at this game, but I'm just still not sold on UCLA. I feel like, like you said, when they, when they played a team with a talent differential in, in Oregon, um, you could see that. And I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take USC to go on the road and win this one. Cover keep the, two? Uh, keep the playoff hopes alive. Yeah. Win and cover. Wow. We differ right away. Right you off might make bat. up some ground, or I, cl- I clinch this. This might be do or die Saturday for us. We'll see. We got three more weeks. I'm not, I'm not worried about. I'm, I'm not watching the scoreboard. Three I'm more just, weeks. Just trust the process. We got, we got conference championship. Week that's only well. a couple of games. You're not making up ground on that. Oh, the conference championship. That's like a full slate these days. We're gonna have okay. a, of all the all the conferences. We got, we got at least ten games right there, right? All right. Um, but yeah, keeping it moving. Going to the Big Ten. The Fighting Illini. On the road, going to the big house, uh, noon kick. Michigan is a 17 and a half point favorite in this one. And I'm not I'm not meaning to question Michigan this whole podcast. I think Michigan is a really good team. I think they kind of pass the eye test more than their resume actually looks impressive. I think they are uh, one of the best teams in the country. 
But with this defense that Illinois has and the running game Illinois has, it, it just seems like that is a recipe that is a recipe to keep the game close. And I know they obviously lost to Purdue. They've lost two straight now to Michigan State and Purdue. And Chase Brown is now questionable this week. But I think it's looking like he's going to play from what people say. It's hard hard to know. But I feel like even if he doesn't play, like he's obviously the X factor and, and gives him a chance to actually potentially win. Um, but I feel like even without Chase Brown, like this is who Illinois is, who's Brett Bielema's teams are. They just they run the football, right? It's their philosophy. So 17 and a half just feels too high to me. So give me Michigan to win, but give me Illinois to cover. Interesting. Um, Michigan and Ohio State. So Michigan is plus 30.2 and Ohio State's plus 31.2 um, in margin of victory. So in terms of just on average when they beat teams, they're beating their opponents pretty handedly. So I think if Michigan, we're going to disagree there. If Michigan wins this football game, I think it's a blowout. If Ohio State wins a football game, they end up uh, blowing them out uh, at some point. They end up breaking away uh, at some point in the Big 12, in the Big 10. Illinois, though, this defense, Ryan Walters has done a great, great job um, with this group. They've struggled the last couple weeks. Like you said, Chase Brown's been banged up. That's a problem. But I will say, this is probably the biggest test for J.J. McCarthy to this point, where he has struggled. Um, the 9-27 of type game that he is uh, prone to have, I don't think he can have here. I think being at home is a huge huge advantage here i think i would probably lean maybe a little bit closer to like hey anything can happen in champagne and some people might even be saying they might pop champagne if this was in champagne but i just (laughs) i don't thank you for the laugh and (laughs) i um i just i don't see the path where in other games i just for the like it's a Purdue type thing where I could see Purdue maybe doing something at Michigan. You gotta be a very specific type of team to go in the big house and beat this era of Jim Harbaugh football. And I don't think Illinois is that kind of team. Um they have three rank three wins over ranked teams in the top fifteen in total, um, which is huge. So they beat Iowa, they beat Minnesota, and they beat Wisconsin. Both uh all three in top fifteen in total defense. So they're winning football games ugly. They can do that. The thing about those three teams, though, is their offense is putrid. And that's not the case with Michigan. Um, they're going to be able to run the football uh, on this Illinois team. I think the Illinois team, it might be close at half, like maybe 13-7 or something. And you're like, oh, Illinois hanging around. They're doing stuff. I just think eventually the quarterback play from uh, Tommy DeVito and company just isn't enough. And I think Michigan blows them out in the second half. So I think... This might be close early, but giving Michigan to win and cover. All right, Michigan, put it on the board. Uh, the next one, another playoff contender. We got the Horned Frogs going on the road to Waco. Mm. The Baylor Bears are a three-point home dog in this one. And um, Are you going to do it? Man, I thought about doing it. I feel like... TCU, everyone in the Big 12 is dangerous. I, I swear, like, it's just, it's a dangerous conference. That's why Here's I what it is. They're not I dangerous. Don't... They're just all bad. And, it, and when we come to terms <laughs> with them all just being bad, we'll feel better about the conference. I hate the term it's dangerous. not true, it's, though. They're all bad. Who's good? TCU's a good team. That's it. And every team, that every game they've played has been close just Everybody's about. bad. Cause, Kansas cause State will lose. there's a lot of quality lose. teams. I don't know. Kansas State will get blown out by Baylor one week. They'll look like the best team in the Big 12 the other week. No, they're all bad. They're all bad we'll outside of TCU. Wildcats, but looking at Baylor, this is a quality conference. You bite your tongue, sir. Baylor and their it's four... the worst Power Five conference this year. I think the ACC is worse. I think the ACC got hit by injuries because I don't think that that's true. Like if Devin Leary doesn't go well, Wake's good, Clemson's that could be good, true. UNC's but good, Pitt's the, fine. But the facts on the, the facts remain. I think Florida State's reason, really good. There's a reason Clemson, They're going North Carolina, three. one loss. Aren't Florida respect. State's really good now. Benson and Travis and company, State, they're fucking. They're looking solid for ACC's sure. better than the Big 12. Let's calm down. It's it's splitting <laughs> hairs. But anyway, Baylor in their uh in their four Big 12 wins this year, they have won the turnover battle three of those four games and are 12 to 5 in turnover differential in those four games. Mm. However, in their three losses, they have lost the turnover battle in all three and are 2 to 8 in the turnover 
battle in those games. So looking at TCU, tied with Kansas State for the fewest turnovers in the Big 12. Max Duggan's only thrown two picks all season. I don't think that's the, winning the turnover battle, I don't think is a uh, winning recipe for uh, Baylor in this one. And so I just think, I think this is a dangerous game, like I said. And I think, I think it's going to be close for a while, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say TCU keeps it going, goes to 11 0. Give me the Horn Frogs. You're just playing to catch me back up. Like, if we were not at the end of the season, you would go Baylor's or home dog of the week. Because it's close and you're trying to catch back up, you're not, you're leaving your Baylor Bears behind. No, sir. I said that I was back on the bandwagon as long as they kept winning, but they just lost last week. So I, I'm officially off. I was, mm. I was on there for a while, though. Okay. Baylor's 0 and 3 against ranked teams this year. Mm. It's not good. They're beating the teams they should and they're getting uh, beat by the teams. They should not uh, beat. Um, TCU has won six of the last seven in this series. Um, I don't know. I feel like the Big 12 championship game is the last two raw to keep TCU out of the playoff. I don't think they're going to stumble uh, these last two weeks. I think Texas was their last big, big test. But all that being said, this is the Big 12. So week over week, it's just you think you understand the conference. And then I, I forgot who compared it to a snow globe. But that is this is absolutely the snow globe conference where you just... Each week you you shake it up and uh, that's your new second best team in the conference. So I don't know. Uh, you could tell me on Baylor. You could tell me on uh, even West Virginia one week. Like and they might be the worst team in the conference. Like it just who knows outside of TCU. But I don't think they get got here. Uh, so I think TCU wins and I think they win big. I think they're playing for playing for something. Uh, and they they know that the the college football playoff is not far out of their grasp so i think they'd take care of business it, especially after beating texas the way they did gave it me the feels like such for sure it was definitely uh, <clears throat> such an all-around win um it feels like such a formula for a an upset though like the huge mm -hmm. win over texas then the letdown baylor's a dangerous team on the road oh and three versus ranked team so they've had their opportunities maybe this is the one they break through it's it's a it's a dangerous formula, I'm telling you. But go yeah. Bears! Hey, look, I'm right there with you. I mean, I want the the Bears to bring out the highlighter uniforms and make this thing happen. We'll Need be, Chip and Joanna on the sidelines. We sideline. shall <laughs> see if it. Oh, honestly, if, if this if this is a fixer upper type of game for the Bears, is that the mm. show? Is it fixer upper? It I is think? fixer upper. Don't act um, like you don't watch it with Tori. No, there's so many names of those HGTV shows. They're all so interchangeable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that is it. Um, staying in the Big 12. They do great work. Speaking, oh, of course. Uh, staying in the Big 12, Kansas State at West Virginia. You know how I feel about Morgantown, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Mountaineers are a seven and a half point home dog in this one. They won five straight in the series before 2021 when Kansas State ended that. I'm going back and forth on this one, sir. What, what, do you, what say you on this one? West Virginia sucks. And we need to kind of get to the point now where I Neil Brown's getting fired after this season. So I'm kind of at the, like, you're already hearing the Rich Rod rumbles, which I'm all about. Their AD, I don't know if you saw, got fired um, this week. So we're going to see. I think changes are coming in Morgantown. Uh, this doesn't work. It doesn't, I feel like it's funny that some schools should be required to run a certain kind of offense or have a certain kind of feel, right? Like Neil Brown was bringing Troy football to Morgantown and it was like, this sucks. I don't want to watch this. And then this year they tried to pivot back to what it was with Graham Harrell and JT Daniels and get fun back in Morgantown. It's been okay. But what sort of offenses should West Virginia be required to have? The spread, the rich rod, the mobile quarterback who's just running all over the place, the Pat White, Geno Smith, uh, gotcha. We want okay. Noel Devine. We want Steve Slayton. We want dudes all over the place, just making plays, fun, no defense, all gas, no breaks. Like Pat White's you gotta not do. walking through that door, sir. Well, look, they can fix this, and I think Rich Rod, who is eight and two at Jacksonville State this year, I would not be surprised if he gets this job back if he wants it. He's from the area. It'd be a homecoming. I he, well, he should he. Honestly, this is the biggest mistake in his career was leaving West Virginia. So. But you take the Michigan job every time. It's one of the five best jobs in college football. You take it. I mean, he had a good thing going work. in a Power 5 conference. Like, he just stayed the course of West Virginia. If they don't blow it against Pittsburgh in 2007, they're in the national championship. True. Like, you were at a place that the ceiling was a national championship. Like, even if it's unlikely, 
he you built what West Virginia was. I, I mean, I Bobby never Bowden left it. West Virginia for Florida State. You had to see. Sometimes you got to go check it out. It's true. Nick Saban's from West Virginia. His dad owned a owned a what was it called? Gas station. Yeah, I've heard. You had to heard leave. Such things. Sometimes you got to leave. Do you hear Jim, this? You? Jimbo, he's from West Virginia as well. It's true. You got to get out of there. Sometimes. A lot of good coaches coming out of West Virginia. Um, yeah, I want to say Calipari is from West Virginia is. as well. Yeah, they um, they get some coaches up there. I don't know. It's something in the something in the water. There you go. Um, all that being said, this has all the makings of like, oh, Kansas State's good. They're they've done this all year, where you think that they're ready to go, and then they juggle and hide it, and they go on the road at Morgantown and get blown out, and you're like, what in the world? Here's the problem. Adrian Martinez is not playing in this game. It is going to be Will Howard, and that was my biggest thing going into this one, <laughs> is Will Howard and Kansas State have reportedly talked, and they're okay with burning his red shirt um, for the rest of the year. So that is, that's big. Uh, Chris Kleiman, the head coach, confirmed that. He's thrown nine touchdowns in his last three games, um, which this is a bonker stat, uh, is the most touchdown passes in three consecutive games by K-State quarterback in school history. Josh Freeman... In 08, Eli, uh, L. Robertson, uh, L. Roberson in 2003, and Chad May in 1994, each through eight. I'm surprised uh, Michael Bishop didn't uh, crack that list. But um, very elite company, and Will Howard is clearly the right guy for the job. I think that's going to settle some of that Jekyll and Hyde snow globe stuff from uh, from Kansas State. I think uh, Deuce Vaughn will run all over this Mountaineer defense, and I think they take care of business on the road in Morgantown. So give me Kansas State to win and cover. I'll be honest, I still don't understand the snow globe um reference, but we'll you shake a snow that. globe and then you everything settles. So it's like you shake it up and then you're like, okay, now look at it. So you but think it it's looks one the thing. same every time you no, it shake doesn't. it up. I mean basically, right? The snow falls down and it just No, things move. What are you talking about? I don't know. Maybe I'm not as maybe I'm not as when you throw it when you shake globe. a snow globe, all the flakes and stuff, they all move yeah. around. They move around, but it looks the same every time you do it. That's does, not. Does it not? You, no, I'm, because I don't know. I'm you're confused. missing the it's point. Not if you, if you miss. You, I don't know what's <laughs> happening here. When you shake a snow globe, all the flakes and stuff they all move around in different spots of where they were before you shook it. Okay, so this is the Big Twelve. It's just the yes. teams are all rearranging every. Yeah, year. they okay. all settle. Remember after this? <laughs> after it's been shaked, shake, fair uh, enough. Shaken, and they uh, then you shake it again, and they're all in different spots. I was thinking more the like don't uh, stay in the same was spot, the game Matt. Peggy Hill played? Uh, was it Boggle or something like that? <laughs> That's why I think that'd be more because then you're 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 changing it. All the letters are different at that point. I feel like a snow globe. Once it's, once they're all moving, it is different, but it all looks the same. That's that's all I'm saying. You know, that's hey, maybe I'm taking your 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 metaphor too literally. But let's keep this thing on track. Mm -hmm. Kansas State, West Virginia. Um, you you made my my point for me. Like I was gonna, as much as I like uh, West Virginia's home field advantage, I feel like uh, this team with Will Howard is just like a better, <clears throat> just a better machine offensively. So they they just seem like they have a much higher floor. Um, than when Adrian Martinez is in the game. So, yeah, give me Kansas State as well to win and cover. All right. Uh, where are we going next? Keeping it moving. Staying in the Big 12. We got Texas going on the road at the Kansas Jayhawks. And mm. the Jayhawks are a nine-point home dog in this one. And um, I think Texas just needs to bounce back. I think Texas is going to uh, – release some of their frustration out on the Kansas Jayhawks. So I feel like this is going to be a big one. I see I see Texas putting up like 40 in this game. Kansas just, you know, they're just not the team they kind of were early in the season. So, yeah, give me Texas to win big. Mm. We keep doing this, though. We're waiting for, like, the beatdown, kind of like what Texas did to Oklahoma, right? They blew them out 49 nothing. Mm -hmm. just a huge, huge beatdown. Kansas obviously won in a crazy way last year uh how many overtimes was that that they beat texas in? what was it oh i'm not even i'm not even sure I can um, that but up. that was that was big at home at ut that was a really embarrassing moment uh for the horns um that's huge kansas defense is not good that's a big part of this is just that like texas is not going to be going up against um a really good defense that uh tcu has put together this year this is gonna be closer to what they saw against oklahoma um they don't inflict any negative plays just not who kansas is whatsoever um they don't have any tackles for losses they're not 
a team that gets in the backfield like TCU was doing a bunch. Last week, they're 103rd in TFLs um, per game at 4.9. Like, nothing about the, te- the Kansas defense really is all that imposing, uh, especially if you're a Texas team. But that being said, Lance Leipold coach this team up. Uh, this offense is still good, and I think this offense will be able to run on Texas a little bit. And I think this is going to come down to the wire, and I think Texas wins. But I think this is super close. I think uh, this is a 50-50 toss-up game for me. But I'm going to go Texas to win, but Kansas to cover. All right. Put it on the board. And it just went to one overtime uh, last year. It's 49-49 hmm. in regulation. Yeah. Um, so then Kansas just scored and went for two on that incredible I think it'll be lower finish. scoring this year. Uh, that's probably a good bet. Um, Texas, Kansas has won two of the last five in this series versus uh, te- uh, Kansas has won two of the last five yeah. in this series versus Texas. So. I don't think I've ever had, when was the last time I beat them twice in a row? It was like 60 something years ago. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I'll let you, I'll let you look that one up for me. Um, keeping it moving. <laughs> Iowa at Minnesota, the golden Gophers two and a half point favorite at home. And um, I was going back and forth with this one. I feel like I was kind of improved as the season's gone along. But what's the trophy for this one? I want to say this is the battle for the Floyd of Rosedale, correct? Okay. For the uh, for the pig, uh, <laughs> I could. Uh, <laughs> that's probably disrespectful calling it a pig. Um, but I, 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 we can look that up. I think it that's is what the Floyd it is. of Rosedale. That's the You're Floyd right. of Rosedale. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just looking at Iowa, averaging 18 points a game this year offensively. Like, just – this has just been one of the worst offenses we've ever seen. The last couple of weeks, they've actually kind of turned a, turned a corner, but I just don't think they're going to be able to keep up Minnesota. And Minnesota's had a really solid defense, so I think they're going to play some good defense. And um, as just a, what, a three-point uh, favorite, I said, a two-and-a-half point, I think Minnesota wins and covers. You think Minnesota wins and covers? I do. Interesting. Okay. Where you disagree not, here? Not an Iowa fan. Iowa. Look, nobody wants to see Iowa in the Big Ten title game, but it's about time that people start taking their medicine, eating their vegetables, and getting ready for Iowa in the Big Ten championship. Game. <laughs> You're probably right about that. I think they're the best team in the West. Like I'm going through the West up and down. I'm like, I think Iowa's the best team in the West. I don't like any more anybody else, but they probably are. <laughs> Um, they're number three in rushing defense. Uh, both Minnesota and Iowa have forced 12 interceptions apiece this year. Um, in the six victories for the Iowa Hawkeyes, four TDs, one pick for Spencer Petras. Something that's interesting, 125 quarterback rating in his two November games. So he's getting back on the right track. Kirk Ferentz is 17-6 all-time against Minnesota, and they've won seven straight in this series. I don't know. We've seen some really bad Minnesota games. Tanner Morgan having a really, really rough time against some of the best defenses in this conference, specifically Illinois a few weeks back. I think he has a lot of problems against this Iowa defense again, and I think uh, Iowa wins outright. Give me the give me the Hawkeyes. All right. Put it on the board. Uh, keeping it moving. Uh, with the Tennessee Volunteers going on the road at South Carolina. Gamecocks, 21 and a half. Are they the home dog of the week this week? Should we take the, the South I'll Carolina I'll punt you from Gamecocks? this podcast. I have the possibility of doing that. Don't you dare. I just want to remind the listeners of how like nonchalant uh, – chase thomas was uh in our preseason sec predictions of tennessee is gonna beat georgia or alabama it's gonna happen but then they'll probably like lose to some south carolina or some have a good 10 and 2 season like it was just some normal thing to happen do you realize the meltdown (laughs) that the absolute just world ending loss this would be if tennessee were to lose to south carolina this week after breaking through and beating alabama this year it would just be unbelievable if something ridiculous like that were to happen spencer rattler we we've been very critical i think we've already said everything we can say about spencer rattler this year he's just not a good quarterback so I think going on the road, you had that crazy stat you shared with me earlier this week that what South Carolina has not, tra- they've not trailed for a home game all season or? No, the that- stat's bonkers. It's like they have not, so they have not 
sp uh, change lead. So if they jump out to a lead, they w they kept That's the lead the whole was. game. If they jumped out behind, they never caught back. They up. have so not had one lead change in yes. SEC play. No, That's whole season they have not had one lead change the whole year. That's absurd. Yeah, but. I think this this game will probably continue that trend because I have a feeling Tennessee will get up 7-0 in this one and probably not look back. So, you know, maybe that williams Bryce Stadium is is good <clears throat> to keep this, you know, within a touchdown or, or two for the first two quarters, but I, I just don't see them hanging with Tennessee. So 21's a big spread, but this feels like a, I don't know, 48-20 kind of game. Like I, I see them like, taking care of business. If you had told me before the season two that I would think Vanderbilt's going to be tougher in the last two weeks on the road than uh, South Carolina, I never would have believed you. But I think Vanderbilt will be a better game than what we're going to see on Saturday. I think Vanderbilt is going to give Tennessee a better game than what wow. South Carolina is going to do. <clears throat> I mean, um, what, with, with what Florida did, not to interrupt but what you're saying, but with what Florida did versus South Carolina last week, it's just like... Is there any confidence whatsoever that they're going to slow down this Tennessee offense? But it's not even just slowing down. The offense has to score. Like, even if they don't slow them down, like, they're not yeah. going bow for bl blow for blow. Like, I don't – they did not score an offensive touchdown last week. It was a punt. That was it. Like, a fake punt, and that was their passing touchdown last week. I, I just – the offense is broken at South Carolina. Uh, Satterfield, Durosi is probably out. Um, it's been to Rattler, eight TDs, nine picks at this point. It is funny that you bring up that I just – not shalomly before the year look clairvoyant chase is a real real thing as you know like you laughed at it you were like a lot of folks jake green in his car riding around atlanta traffic was like 10 and 2 tennessee <laughs> not on my watch all my georgia fans back home all of my atlanta folks they were like 10 and 2 that what uh, what orange kool-aid is chase drinking like splitting I don't, know, I don't know what my preseason prediction was but i i might i may have said 10 and 2 9 and 3 no? Maybe you said nine and three, eight and four. I think you eight and four was your exact on the record thing. I thought you said best case scenario was eight and four. I'll see. I'll have to, I'll have to dig that up. Yeah. Um. I'm gonna say you said eight and four, but don't dig it up because just in case, I'd, I'd rather <laughs> just keep it. Uh. Whatever. But ten and two. I said they were gonna split Bama and Georgia. They split Bama and Georgia. That being said, it's easy to say in the beginning, like, oh, and then they'll just drop a stupid game at the end and go ten and two. Now that we're here. It's like, oh, if they do that in one of these final two weeks, I'm going to lose my mind. It would be, I mean, <laughs> one of the more painful uh, sports fan experiences of my life is if they drop one of these two games. And then if we find out later, if they had just taken care of business, they're in the playoff uh, for sure. Because um, it might not matter if they drop these one yeah. of these two games. We'll see, you'll see them lose to South Carolina and then TCU, USC and, TCU 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 and USC lose today. Yeah, same day. That'd be brutal. I just don't see it. I, uh, this Tennessee team's focused. They're, they're old. Hinden Hooker has just been an animal. They score 66. They set it at, uh, a school record in yards with over 700 last week. South Carolina got absolutely obliterated when they came to Knoxville last year. They're only slightly better um, than that team we saw a year ago. Like you said, it's at night. That'll help for them. They have a good home crowd. That'll help for them. But, man, the orange helmets in here. I don't know how you feel about those, but... South mm. Carolina's 46 in S&P Plus. Ball's number five. Um, it's just when you see the Spurs Up show, good uh, South Carolina podcast, they said Spencer Rattler is a good quarterback in an extremely mediocre offensive system. The teams that beat Tennessee are not the teams in the off. And, like, the only team to beat Tennessee and hang with Tennessee was not a mediocre offense. Todd Monken has an elite uh, offensive mind and elite offense. Like, that's how you beat Tennessee is you have to have an elite offensive team to hang with Tennessee because they are going to score like Mizzou eventually ran out of gas and they eventually just didn't have enough. Like they had some plays, Brady cook did some stuff with his legs. But also and... the reason Georgia beat him was definitely because of the defense more than the offense. No, Stetson scoring. was hitting shots deep. Stetson was doing stuff like there. No, Monken was but hold, up. holding this team to 13 points. Like ultimately, right. I mean, that's, I think the defense is, is the answer. Cause Missouri, like you said, Missouri was scoring with them like mm -hmm. for two and a half quarters, but yeah. You can't just try to outscore this team. It's it's not going to work. But then you Tennessee went on the thirty-eight nothing run. Like that's the whole yeah. thing. It's like eventually Tennessee is going to go on a run, and I just don't think South Carolina has the means to go blow for uh, blow for blow. So give me the Vols to win and cover. I think this is a blowout. But like I said, I think Vanderbilt will be tougher of uh, the two. 
Yeah, that's a. Did you know Kirk Herbstreit and Fowler's calling this game? No, are you sure? I heard that this week because like there, this game's on ESPN or ABC, one of the two. Yeah, and the, this is ESPN, and then the primetime um, ABC game is Bedlam. So I mean, that's not. It's not really a better. I mean, it's probably a better game, more evenly matched yes, game. Yes, Kirk Herbstreit and Chris Fowler are calling this one. Wow, that's that's interesting. I think they're trying to. Uh, <laughs> It's kind of a transition into like, hey, let's get everyone used to us calling SEC games every Saturday night. It's uh, it's 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 the future. I'm not looking forward to my text from my family who are like, Kirk Herbstreit really wants the Gamecocks to win. He's just all about <laughs> Spencer Rattler. Oh my God, that's gonna happen. Uh, they are convinced funny. Kirk Herbstreit does not like Tennessee, and I'm like, Kirk's fine. He, Gary he, Danielson does have an amazing talent for <laughs> hating every single SEC team. Yep. Um, it's pretty funny, but um, we'll keep it moving. We got locked in. Except Alabama. That. I think every SEC fan thinks he loves Alabama. I'm sure too. Alabama fans think he think he thinks he hates <laughs> them. They ah think they hate his team too. Mm-hmm. Um, so keeping it moving, Georgia and Kentucky, the Bulldogs going. Chris Doring's preseason upset of the year. <laughs> Kentucky beating Georgia. CBS really wants this one back uh, from their 330 slot uh, after Kentucky just laid an absolute egg against Vanderbilt last week. Um, Kentucky's a 22 and a half point dog in this one. And there's not much you can really say. Like Kentucky is just when they're when they're playing their game, like their their game is 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 Georgia's game, right? Like they're not going to out Georgia, Georgia. So when they're playing their game is like what you saw in 2021 when they're I think undefeated. This was college game day last year, like 7 and 0, 8 and 0 versus 8 and 0. But Kentucky just took the ball out of took the air out of the ball, like won the time of possession. It's like cool. Well, you you lost by, you know, I think they ended up making it kind of close, like 17 points or something, but they had like an 11 minute drive in the game. And that's when Kentucky is actually doing what they do well. This year, they haven't done what they are supposed to do well. They don't run the ball that well. Um, and I just, with what we've seen from Georgia, if, if you do take away that, like their defense has been solid. Um, but if you take away the run, Georgia can beat you uh, with the pass. So um, vice versa. I don't see them really slowing down Georgia in this one. I feel like I disrespect Kentucky when they're playing well, to be honest. They just, they feel like a feel good story, kind of overachieving when they're doing well, but never really scare Georgia. So when they're not playing well, I think they're going to get probably boat raced. So give me Georgia to win this one and cover. Yeah. I don't see this being particularly close. I think this is another one. I do think it's interesting, though, Curry was talking about it's like going to be nice to just play a normal team again uh, this week, a normal offense. So I don't think they're really all that fearful of what Kentucky's going to do. And the Kentucky offensive line is just a train wreck. Uh, they're not running the ball as well as a year ago. Um, Brown still a guy out wide, but I don't see him uh, breaking out against this Georgia secondary. And I just – Jalen Carter against the interior of this Kentucky offensive line is just going to be <laughs> – I poor Will Levis because this is just going to be a nightmare for him. I think this is mm-hmm. going to be the closest. I think this is, and maybe just because uh, at Kentucky they get a little bit of benefit of the doubt there. But man, I just I don't see the path of this being like a Mizzou Georgia situation whatsoever. I don't I don't think that's going to happen. I think this can be more like Auburn uh, Georgia from a few weeks back. That's what it reminds me the most of right now. So give me the dogs to win and cover. And Auburn gave Georgia a game for maybe two quarters. So, mm-hmm. you know, it could, we could see some of that. But um, with what you saw from Georgia uh, against Missouri and Mississippi State, both on the road, you'd really like to see them take care of the ball, not turn it over, because that's when Georgia kind of made some games interesting is, is uh, when they turned the ball over. So um, hopefully they can take care of that and uh, take care of the Wildcats. Uh, but yeah, we got agreement on that one as well. George and Tennessee both covering their big spreads. Keeping it in the SEC, Ole Miss Rebels at the Arkansas Razorbacks. And I feel like this has been the battle of my preseason predictions. I was not high on Ole Miss, and they've been a, a quality team all year. Nearly beat the Crimson Tide last week. I was, however, high on Arkansas coming in, and it's just not been the season uh, that Arkansas hoped for coming in. But with that said, sir, 
The Razorbacks are a two and a half point dog in this one. And Ole Miss is just, they've been susceptible. And I, I like the way Arkansas, they fought against LSU last week at home again. I don't care who the quarterback is. I, I think KJ Jefferson might be back. I don't know if it's going to be Cade Fortin in this one. I don't think it matters, sir. I think the Razorbacks can uh, can do something to this Ole Miss team. So give me the Razorbacks. Home dog of the week. Wow. Home dog of the week. But do you have them winning this one outright? Yeah, they're winning. Oh. Two and a half point dog. This, I think Vegas knows something here. This is a two and a half point spread. Number 11 versus a five and four team. I think, or are they four, five and four? Am I, I think I'm I think they are five game. and four. They, they've played 10 games, I think, so far. Oh, then they're five. five and five. They might be five and five. Uh, looking at scores, trying to pull it up. Um, but yeah, Arkansas has definitely been super disappointing this year, but they need, they need their one mark. What are they, win. Matt? How do you not buy this kit record already? What are we doing over there? Yeah, they, I'm sorry. They, they are five and five. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Um, yeah, so they're five and five. They gotta win one of these last two with Ole Miss and at Missouri to finish the to finish the season to get bowl eligible. Give me the Razorbacks. Get it done. This is not Arkansas's year. I think this is just the vibes are bad all around. Like losing at Liberty at home, that was embarrassing. That's just a rough, rough loss uh, for the Hogs. Um, the offensive output going to third string quarterback, uh, Gwinnett legend, uh, against LSU that didn't work. Malik Hornsby was obviously not the guy, um, not looking great. Uh, but you know, KJ Jefferson still has two years of eligibility after this year in the SEC. Is that right? Yeah. Connor O'Gara was tweeting out, uh, which quarterbacks eligibilities are left. And, um, he has two, uh, he's one of two quarterbacks with two. I think it's him and dart, um, the conference, but, um, yeah, we'll we'll see what happens on that front. But I just nothing's going right with them, and I think KJ will play in this one. But Old Miss is going for back to back ten win seasons. Uh, all I have to do is uh, get one uh, or get uh, these final two, and they'll get there. But look, man, I I just Jackson Dart did not make the big throws late. Um, against Alabama to win. Like, if he makes that throw over the middle to Mingo or he does enough, because they put the ball in his hands, if you watch the end of uh, that Alabama game, where they went away from Quinchon, who was awesome, and Bama didn't really have an answer for Quinchon Jenkins, who has just become a star in this conference and a star for the Rebs. I don't think Arkansas is going to be able to stop Jenkins. And I think this how this game might be decided is Kiffin's got to adjust where him and Charlie Weiss Jr. cannot go away from what worked down the stretch. So if this game's close... Don't feel the need to put it in Dart's hands because you're just like, all right, game's in the line. We got to put it in our quarterback's hands. Just like keep doing stuff with uh, Judkins. He's your best player on offense, and I don't think it's particularly close. Live and die with him. Let him uh, let him cook and let him finish this because Ole Miss is number one in rushing place, in long rushing place in the conference. Um, are, interestingly enough, Raheem Sanders and uh, the Razorbacks are number two. So I think this game will be a lot of stuff on the ground, keeping the ball out of KJ and Jackson's hands. But I think the difference here is Dart and Hinden Hooker are tied with average yards per completion at 14.2. I think people discount a little bit of what uh, Ole Miss's uh, quarterback can do. He doesn't really hurt you all that much, but when he does have big plays, he finds them. He finds Mingo and company when he needs to. I think still Ole Miss will bounce back. I don't think uh, at home or on the road, here at Arkansas is where they fall again. And I think Kiffin gets back-to-back 10-win seasons, I think. It's going to be wild, but I don't know who had before the year. LSU, Ole Miss, and Alabama all going 10-2 and in the West, but I think that's how it ultimately ends up. So give me the Rebs to win and cover. All right. Put it on the board. And uh, Kiffin needs this. This last 10-win little, little milestone before he goes – takes that job at at auburn on the plains people are talking like it's a done deal we don't uh we don't we don't spread rumors on this podcast but uh it's the right fit that's who auburn should hire and then keep cadillac on staff and make him associate head coach or something like uh cadillac can't go anywhere that sound like a hater was i the only person that just thought the the post game auburn celebration was just so over the top yeah you're a hater that's strong hater energy terrible it was honestly terrible take hold on hold on hold on 
I will not blame the energy in the stadium, the crowd atmosphere. I was all for the that was that was awesome. Like who mm-hmm. cares? It's a meaningless game to everyone else. So you just won, whatever. Celebrate, do your thing, swag surfing and all that. The interview, the post game interview with Cole Kublik and Cadillac Williams went on for like four minutes too long. It was like the first statement, Cadillac. Oh, you know, just this family, you know, this university means so much to me. What, what a yada yada, like just the typical stuff. And then he just asked him like five more questions and he just answers it the same way every time. Like, look at this, look at this crowd. It's like, look at this, this family. It's like, okay, you guys didn't just win the national championship. Let's relax. Like it was, it, I feel like it went on for entirely too long. It could have been a 30 second post game interview. It was like four minutes long. This is the worst Matt Green take I've ever heard on this podcast. Like, it whatever was, I've ever said before, I've never had this much haters ball energy quite like Matt here. That was I'm, an incredible it, post-gamer from Cadillac. It, it, I was ready to really? run through a brick wall for that guy. He didn't say anything. He was, like, happy about it, but it was like he didn't he didn't say anything else. It was just like, yeah. What it meant, and looking around of, like, our team's having a season from hell, and they still pack this thing, and we still still care and it's just that was the ultimate it just means more game and like the difference between football and the sec and everywhere else in the country like you're not doing that with a three win um three win kansas team three win uh iowa state team a three win um it washington cole, team it was cole kublik he's an auburn guy he's yeah. like i'm gonna keep this interview going it was just, it, it went on way too long. Like I said, I'm not going to hate on the energy in the stadium. The, it was great seeing them how they celebrated at whatever their third win of the season. No, him like, talking about I'm like, you got to take these guys under your wing and they got to let, like, make mistakes. You got to show that you care. I said you I'm going to sound like a hater. It you went really on do. for entirely, it went on for entirely too long. I stand by it. I stand by that take. I mean, I, I'm happy for you, but just <laughs> your parents hear this take. Tori will hear this take. My dad will hear this take. You want to put your name to it? That's on. It's on you. They can all go watch the four-minute clip <laughs> that was the post-game interview. It just went on way too long. I stand by it, mm. but we'll keep it moving. Going to Bedlam, uh, seven thirty prime time, ABC, Oklahoma State at Oklahoma. Oklahoma's a seven and a half point favorite in this game, and I was kind of surprised. I know they're at home, but like. I just, I've not, like, oh, both of these teams are trending in the, wrong, in the wrong direction, right? But I feel like Oklahoma, like, seems like they have no direction. I feel like I still have some hope for Oklahoma State. Like, I've seen this 2022 team look good at times. I haven't seen that from Oklahoma. So, I'm, I'm taking Oklahoma State to, to win outright. Like, I, I don't, I'm just not impressed by Oklahoma this year. And give me, give me the Cowboys. This is do or die time in our pickup, man. Because I disagree again, Matt Green. Man, we really, this is going to be the week that does it for sure. <laughs> uh, no pressure or anything. But yeah, this is this is the week because the Cowboys have not beaten the Sooners back-to-back since 2000 and 2001. It's not uh, in the Cowboys' nature to run this rivalry. It's still, even down situations. It's just not not the Cowboys. The Sooners have something to play for. They're trying to get a bowl game here, Matt Green. They're fighting for their bowl game lives uh, in year one here for Mr. Venables. Um, two and eight in their last 10 against the Sooners. Mike Gundy uh, has not been able to get that monkey off his back here. Um, Oklahoma State. Here's what's weird about this matchup. I can't figure it out because like Oklahoma State has the worst pass defense in the Big 12. It's a problem. Here's the thing. Oklahoma's eighth in pass offense. Part of that is Dylan Gabriel missing some time due to injury, but like they have not been able to throw the ball really well uh, all season long. They've been carried by Eric Gray, who former Tennessee legend, Eric Gray has been fantastic over a thousand (laughs) yards this season for the Sooners. He's been great. OU has the worst run defense in the conference. That's how they've been getting obliterated by Texas and company. Oklahoma state is the number nine rushing conference, uh, rushing offense in the conference. So they're not really going to take advantage of OU's biggest weakness. I don't think this is a great matchup for the Cowboys. I don't think they're in it. I think they're kind of having the season from hell too. So give me the Sooners to win and cover. I think this is going to be a big day for Venables. I think this is like one of those, like, we're fine. Everyone breathe. We're fine here in Norman. 
He needs it for sure. I feel like everyone's left Oklahoma State for dead. And mm-hmm. I mean, Kansas State loses this week. I guess Kansas State still has to lose twice because they uh, have the head-to-head. But Oklahoma State can definitely still make the Big 12 championship. They need a lot of help, like, it's though. Not, I think they need Kansas State to lose both of their last yeah. two in order to, to do that. Which And then winning both they, their last they, two. And they got to win both their last two. Which who are their, Who's their last one? They got, um, I know they got West Virginia this week. Um, and, then, and then Kansas to finish mm-hmm. it off. So it's not likely. But don't, uh, don't sleep on the Cowboys. Um, That's what I'm doing. <laughs> you're sleeping. Um, a lot of sleep moving. references. Going to Bedlam, get it bed, and then don't sleep oh, on the Cowboys. Geez. I gave you a oh, man. I gave you a small chuckle for the first <laughs> for the first joke. I, I can't get behind that one. Um, our last one, ten thirty. You gonna make it up for this one? I got my. I might have to try to get a nap or something. Um, I don't oh, know. I'll be awake. Yeah, no, I'm watching this one from start to finish for sure. I hate this being ten thirty. Why? Is, uh, no other things on. This is prime time get like cozy get a nice little weighted UCLA. blanket on we got UC, usc ucla starting at eight o'clock that's a reasonable west coast start true i gotta i gotta stay up till 10 30 for this one i mean whew, that'll be tough mm. i mean obviously it's not gonna end at 10 30 but regardless <laughs> uh utah at oregon oregon is a three point uh home favorite in this one i think we all it's well well documented how utah uh took care of just basically dominated Oregon back-to-back games uh, back in 2021. And Utah feels like they're coming along right at the right time this year. But I don't know. I feel like I like Oregon to bounce back this week. I Utah just hasn't been the typical, like, just solid defense that they've been in most years. Like, they don't, they don't necessarily run the ball as well as they have in most years. I think that's where Oregon's going to give them a hard time. I don't think they're going to stop this Oregon rushing attack. So give me the Ducks to win and cover. Hmm. This is what's interesting. And I think this is ultimately how it ends for uh, the Pac-12. I think Oregon still ends up winning the Pac-12 because I think they're actually the best team. And Healthy Bo Nicks, I think they beat Utah this week. I think they beat Oregon State next week. And then I think they beat uh, USC in the Pac-12 title game. But it is interesting because, look, Utah beat Oregon twice last year. They swept them um, in both games. So different situation, not Dan Lanning. That was Mario Cristobal. But the Ducks are 23-12 and all-time against uh, Utah. Utah is number one in scoring TDs in the red zone in the conference. And I think that's, like, when you watch them play, and part of it um, – it's just that like cam rising so sneaky and they just they know what they're doing and they get in the red zone they can run the ball they can do cool stuff with their tight ends like they are just built for little by little and finding ways to put the ball in the end zone just try they're just very different than the rest of usc oregon and uh ucla and washington and the way they scored utah is just this outlier in the conference but it works by and large um Oregon though is only right by, is right behind him like the shotgun draw touchdown that Bo Nix can do. Um, they have a two headed monster running back. Um, they they do stuff inside as well, and then obviously you got the deep threat in Troy Franklin who's been awesome for them. But a lot of different ways they can beat you. I don't know what their center situation is this week because that was an issue when he got hurt Forsyth um, last week. I don't know if he's a game time decision, but him and Bo Nix both nicked up, so that's something to monitor for this one. But Oregon's number one in forty plus yard plays. They have big plays. Bo Nix has been exceptional. That's why you look at his yards per attempt. And before he got injured in that Washington game, he was finding big play after big play. Just a efficient machine uh, in Eugene this year. Um, Utah's last with two. They are not a big a big time team in terms of big plays. They have two total yards of 40 plus yard plays. They have one, I think, anything past that. So the final thing that puts me for the Ducks here to win and cover. Utah has lost two of their biggest road games this year, Florida and UCLA. This is on the road. They are a different team on the road than they are at home. Going to Autzen, I don't think this Oregon team loses back-to-back big home games in the Pac-12. So give me the Ducks to right the ship here and win and cover. All right, lock it in. Uh, That is our slate for Week 12. Uh, we we disagree on four games. Uh, oh, I thought it was more. I was thinking it was more as well. A couple of different, um, couple against the spreads, 
in there that we differ on. Well, hold yeah, on. Overall, the ones we we UCLA and USC. It's one. Yeah. Um, Iowa, Minnesota, we disagree on. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ole Miss, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Those I guess are so. Yeah. Four. And then I, I'm taking Illinois against the spread, where you have Michigan winning outright. Um, and then you're taking Kansas against the spread. I'm taking Texas to win and cover. So a couple of different uh, uh, picks. Well, there, we might yeah. be tied depending on how this, this goes this week. This could be a uh, this could be a you can make up ground. Saturday. Without a doubt, we'll see. We'll see what happens after your seven and four overall last week to my nine and two. That's uh, it's going to take another one of those for me to, to to work my way back up in the standings. Well, let's hope not. Let's Time hope will not. tell. Wait, who's Zeus's home dog of the week? Uh, that's the Arkansas Razorbacks. Okay. All right. At least you picked one that was on the slate this week. Hey, Zeus is just... It wasn't on the slate last week, but the West Virginia Mountaineers, they got it done. I almost did it two weeks in a row, but... You know, Arkansas, I want to say that was his home dog uh, week five. I may have picked him to beat Alabama completely. Um, not one of not one of Zeus's better picks, but uh, he's going to go back to the Arkansas well one more time this year and see if it, uh, see if it pays off. Bold strategy, Cont, and let's see if it pays off for him. Exactly. Uh, Matt Green, always a pleasure, and I will talk to you on Sunday night. Yes, sir.